is not just a person who can open letters and fold them and stick them back together again without anyone noticing. He works on invisible inks. He works on methods of counterfeiting seals. He designs fortifications. He designs explosives. He designs a way of piloting a ship remotely so that you can do, drive fire ships into into foreign things, which, of course, with the Amada is quite a useful technique. And he also, even at one point, seems to be behind designing a, a new sort of string for, for the vial that makes a, a, a dreadful instrument sound better than the best instrument. So he's he's kind of polymath doing all sorts of stuff all over the place and desperately trying to get patronage, constantly, constantly asking Walsingham for patronage and constantly asking for continual employment. Welcome to the Spymasters podcast. I'm your host, Antonia Senior, and it's my mission to bring you all the best writers in the world of espionage, past and present, fiction and non-fiction. In this episode, I'm talking to Nadine Ackerman and Pete Langman, two academics who have written an absolutely fascinating book on the early modern world of espionage. Spycraft looks at the tricks and tools used by early modern spies, and I found it utterly eye-opening. I have plenty more interviews with top writers coming up, including the novelists Jane Thin and Alec Marsh. So don't forget, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Don't miss an episode. And now I'll hand you over to me, talking to Pete and Nadine about early modern spycraft. Pete and Nadine, thank you so much for joining me on the Spymasters podcast. It's our pleasure. Thank you. Uh, We're here to talk about spycraft, your brilliant new book about the... A, a physical history almost of spying and spycraft in early modern England. Uh, could you just start maybe by filling in the listeners about the the theme of the book and, and what brought you to write it? Yes, so we're concentrating on spying techniques in the early modern period. So not so much on the spies as the things that they did, uh, the things that they held in their hands, the kind of tactile nature of spying. Uh, And we basically concentrate on a hundred years from the beginning of the reign of Elizabeth I, 1558, to the duration of the monarchy in 1660 um, um, in England. And we see the Secret Service developing from quite an amateur operation to something which at the end of that period uh, comes close to a semi-professional organization. And it all started when I was um, promoting my, my other book, a couple of years ago, Invisible Agents, um, Women and Espionage in the 17th Century Britain. And I had rediscovered a a network of about 60 women in the dangerous trade, and everyone was really excited about these women. But at literary festivals, they also asked, what we really want to know is how they mix their invisible ink. Uh, (laughs) So these women are well and good, but they wanted to uh, hear more about the techniques that spies used on a day-to-day basis. Absolutely. And of course, us being us thought, well, we'll have to write a book about that. Right. So um, you, one of the things that I think we need to establish when we, before we kind of get into the nitty gritty of uh, the the kind of tactile um, spycraft is uh, you have a quite interesting moment in the beginning of the book where you define spy, because obviously we all know what we think it means now. Uh, you know, it's a very Cold War dominated idea of what it is as a profession. But what does a spy look like in early modern England? Who are we talking about? In this period, um, a cultural historian, Peter Burke, has said that there was no such thing as a spy. There was a lot of spying going on, but it, because it was still so amateur, you can't really talk about a real spy as, as a kind of modern a spy. So they were called intelligences, uh, people who were collecting secret information, and um, it, it became spying when when the kind of spy handler uh, tried to act upon that secret information. And also, there was a, a, a great overlap between diplomats and spying. The, the dip, uh, diplomats were called honourable spies. So the the boundaries between certain, I suppose in in some ways that hasn't changed now, of course, the boundaries between certain professions and spying were rather flexible. It's just the same with criminality. There are a lot of criminals who kind of worked, ended up working as spies and worked as spies simultaneously. And a lot of the things that these spies did was fundamental were fundamentally illegal or immoral. And the only reason that they they weren't imprisoned was because of the the spy master they had as their patrons. And of course, when they're, if their spy master patron fell, 
they suddenly found themselves on the wrong side of the law. So it's 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 a real thing that you have to constantly juggle and constantly ask yourself what these people are doing. So, but yes, it's, it's just calling them a spy is, is a bit is a bit simple, simplistic perhaps. And there's no sort of centralised spy agency as we would think about now. And you you talk about patrons, and the, one of the things that you make quite clear in the book is that actually what was happening was there was quite a lot of competition between different potential spy patrons and the idea even that you have one you know monarch authorized spy master is also a bit of a a misunderstanding yes absolutely it's very anachronistic we think of sir francis walsingham as the spy master in the period and he certainly was successful, but he was just one of many spy chiefs. You also had the Cecil, the Cecils, uh, William Cecil and his son, Robert Cecil. Um, you had the Earl of Essex, the, the Earl of Leicester. Um, they all had their little spy networks and they were competing with each other for information. And these spy chiefs were competing for favour uh, from the monarch, from Elizabeth Elizabeth I. So they weren't necessarily sharing information. And all these men happened to hate each other as well. Uh, So they were really kind of rifles. Yeah, you can see really kind of writ large in the fate of Essex and and of some of the things that Essex did. Um, The whole um, Lopez affair was Essex trying to show off what he could do. Look, look what I can do. I can solve this, solve this great conspiracy to, to have you assassinated. And then, of course, after he, his rather foolish rebellion, his, he's cut off completely and, and literally. And then all of his spy, the people he has working for him, the spies and, and the intelligences are basically cut loose. And, and people like, uh, I mean, Francis Bacon was one of them and his brother, Anthony Bacon. Anthony Bacon only seems to have survived because he was Francis Bacon's brother. But I mean, they're, they're all cut loose and most of them find themselves completely unemployed and then unemployable. But the good ones would, of course, have been grasped. And one of the, the spies that we do, the, the counter espionage agents we talk about, and Arthur Gregory, is one of these who is cut loose. He wants to be at one of Essex's crew, fails to get in. And that was probably quite a good thing for him, to be honest with you. There's, I mean, there's, there are many, many fascinating characters uh, in the book, but you open with one in particular, um, Arthur Gregory, uh, who you describe as the kind of early modern equivalent of Q from the from the Bond books, which I thought was a lovely description. So tell tell us about why you start with him, and tell us a little bit about what he's up to. Yeah, he epitomizes the characters he, whom we try to capture in the book. Um, so not so much the spies as as the cues behind the spies, those who who invent the, the, the techniques and those who perfect the techniques. Um, and Arthur Gregory is unique in in the sense that we have his name, so we could trace him in the archives. Uh, he was already famous during his own lifetime. You have William Camden, the historian who writes the uh, kind of history of the reign of Elizabeth I, describing him as being an expert in the folding of letters. And that is what every historian ever since has repeated about Arthur Gregory. Uh, but the, nobody has really looked into him, what he, he, he could also do. And he does many things. Yes, I mean, he's, he's not just a person who can open letters and fold them and stick them back together again without anyone noticing. He works on invisible inks. He works on methods of counterfeiting seals. He designs fortifications. He designs explosives. He designs a way of piloting a ship remotely so that you can d- drive fire ships into, into foreign things, which, of course, with the Amada is quite a useful technique. And you also, even at one point seems to be behind designing a new sort of string for for the vial that makes a, a, a dreadful instrument sound better than the best instrument. So he's he's kind of polymath doing all sorts of stuff all over the place and desperately trying to get patronage, constantly, constantly asking Walsingham for patronage and constantly asking for continual employment. That was one of the things I found so interesting was, um, you know, you, you, you've described these guys as amateurs and of course they are. And I suppose in the sense they're not salaried, but actually given the constraints of the time, what we're talking about is actually quite sophisticated tradecraft. I mean, there's all sorts of elements to it, which I'm sure we're going to pick apart in, in, in the course of this talk. But what the overwhelming impression I got through reading your book was actually it was much more sophisticated than I think I'd understood. 
Yes, um, I think that the difference is that there were only kind of a handful of people who are really specializing in this. And once they die or once they disappear, or once they get imprisoned, their expertise dies with them. Uh, so it disappears again and the wheel needs to be invented again and again. But certainly the experts who are around uh, are, are, are quite capable of handling sophisticated techniques. Yes, I suppose in that one respect, they are kind of artisan tradesmen who are working in a certain trade. At, at, at absolutely right, in some cases, at an extremely high level. But unless they take on apprenticeships, apprentices, which, of course, certain people did. I mean, Bacon and Philippez were both taken to France in, in the embassy of Sir Maurice Porret, who ended up in, in the, during the Barrington Affair was um, Mary Queen of Scots jailer. So they, he took them both to France on an embassy where they were to learn about the French, well, Bacon went officially to learn about the French legal system. Um, but obviously they, they worked a lot on cryptography while they were there because they were both really interested in it and carried on being interested in it. And Philippe's son was, was later, no, was it his brother? His, his brother. brother. His late, younger brother was later sent to the Bacon's um, entourage, as, again, as a kind of apprenticeship. So either they had apprentices or their secrets died with them. Right. And there, there were quite a lot of secrets to die. So you separate the book into um, uh, different chapters. Um, and maybe it might be quite useful to sort of follow your excellent structure to kind of talk through them. So you talk about um, initially you talk about fraud and forgery being the obviously the the. Um, the quite sophisticated way that people are trying to forge each other's letters and their seals and um, that seemed to me to be fascinating and you you'd had to do so much work from a starting point about different quills and different inks because obviously it, it never occurred to me but if you're trying to forge someone's you know pen and ink letter you have to think about what ink it is and what pen it is Yes, absolutely. Um, we start with, with that chapter because the letter is so important in this period. It's really the only a, only means people have to communicate over long distance apart from a private messenger, uh, which would be much more expensive. And of course, you never know way, whether you can trust that private messenger anyway. So the only way people had to communicate over distance is the letter. Um, and I think that the letter is different than we imagine it to be in our heads. Um, the envelope wasn't invented until, until the 19th century. So in this period, people uh, had their writing sheet. They wrote their message and they folded, folded that writing sheet, making it into its own sending package. And everyone had a, a unique fit way of folding their letters. So there was many ways uh, how you could secure a letter shot. Right, exactly. So that when you when Arthur um, Gregory was referred to as an expert in folding letters, that's what we're talking about. Yes, absolutely. Mimic the style of other people's letter yeah. folding. But also, <laughs> he he the, his ability to be able to open them without it being obvious that they've been opened. And of course, one of the the, the points of some of the folding techniques, and also one of the points of a wax seal, is to to add security so that it's difficult to to open a letter without it being obvious. And again, it's, it's, it's always important to remember and to remind yourself when you're working in this period that things weren't mass produced. So it's, it's not just that the envelope hadn't been invented. It's just that when we think of, of a letter, envelopes are envelopes, they're all the same. I mean, you might get different brands, but they're all the same. At, at this point, every single letter is made by the letter writer or somebody affiliated with them, very close to them. And the, the closest you get to, to mass production is the paper will come from a certain paper mill. But I mean, in, in certain circumstances, there are very few paper mills certainly supplying England because there weren't any paper mills in England at this time. It's, it's a little later that the first one starts. So they're all coming from France. Or it's all coming from France. But apart from the paper, everything else is even the ink is mixed at home. And so we've got people you look at the recipes for inks and they're, they're all fundamentally the same, but they're all different. So they will be they'll be slightly different. Um, levels of black and there'll be slightly different ways that they'll fade and there'll be slightly different ways that they'll spread on the paper and again as you say with the quills everyone cuts their own quill and you cut your own quill to the way that you write and that absolutely changes the way that your letters letters are formed and the way that they look and we have so many instances of people I mean 
either individuals or, or kind of institutional people saying, well, I've got a, a, we've got a letter from X, or we've got a letter from this, this, this place, and it just looks wrong. It's not folded right. The ink's wrong. The handwriting's wrong. I just don't believe that this is real. And, and this is continuous because they're, they're all very sharp at this in a way that we probably aren't now because we don't notice some of the subtle gradata- gradations of, of hands and of envelope, envelope letter packet folding and, and seals and all this stuff. It's just so fascinating. It's just the, the type of thing that, again, I guess with a kind of modern sensibility, it would just never have occurred to me. And I've read an awful lot of novels set in this period involving spies. <laughs> and I, and I've, uh, I've not, um, yeah, that, those sort of gradations of kind of ink is just an extraordinary way of looking at it. In terms of you writing that, I mean, I know, uh, so you, you talk about these recipes for making ink and it's obvious that you guys like to get a bit hands on. Were you making these inks? Oh, absolutely. I think to understand what people are sort of experiencing, what they are noticing, it's so telling if you start just making such a recipe and you think, okay, what what will it look like? Is there a real difference between these two? Um, So we try to do that with inks, with, um, with seals. Um, the folding of letters as much as we could. We stayed away from the poisons. So that's the only <laughs> thing uh, that we didn't try ourselves. Well, uh, yeah, we'll check the headlines if you want, yes. you know, I'll watch out, watch out for that one. So um, tell me your, give me your sort of favourite alchemic recipe for making early modern ink. How would you do it? I didn't, I wouldn't even know where to start. Well, the, the basic um recipe for, for early modern ink at this time is, is pretty standard really it's it's an iron gall ink and it's made by mixing um uh gall water which you make by crushing galls which are the the growths the the woody growths on trees that are caused when a, a gall wasp lays its egg in, in a bud or a leaf um and the, the that's the tree's reaction to it which ends up protecting the the grub of the wasp but you dry those and you crush them and you then soak them in water and some people say vinegar and some people say wine it depends on the recipe and you end up with a kind of mildly acidic solution of galatanic acid then you mix that with um a um, sulfate so normally a copper acid is, is the most common one ferrous sulfate which then precipitates and that's again is a, is a clear liquid and that precipitates a very dark black um precipitate which i can't even remember the the, the, the actual um chemical formula for it's in the book so i can't offhand remember what it is but it precipitates this very dark precipitate which when you use which is your ink and when you put that on the page it dries that oxidizes and it makes a, yet another substance which is waterproof and permanent very very permanent and so basically that's all all the ink recipes but you have various different you can also use different sulfates so you can use um copper sulfate instead of so and the various vitriols all give a slightly different color and there are all sorts of different ways they have different inks for making different very different colored inks so um, one of them uses dragon's blood which isn't dragon's blood but which is great pity but but it's they call it dragon's blood it's i can't even it's one of the plants isn't it and it's so there are all these things where they have different types of ink and, and some you'll also add things like gum arabic to them to make them flow differently because the difference in the different ways that they flow at, works with the quill again to make make them work in certain letter forms better and as as we point out it depends on the size of your letters and what kind of thing you're you're doing to def- defines what kind of quill you use whether you use a, a say a swan or a goose or a crow and also which wing you take it from depending on whether you're right-handed or left-handed because it curves in a certain way obviously i mean this is the first thing you think about is, is i'm going to get my my crow quill which wing do i want and then it and we've got this one guy who gives specific instructions he says you know these three feathers from from the main flight feathers are the best ones of course so you've got all these crows with their three main flight feathers taken off i presume floating around not not, not flying very well but all these tiny little things make add up to make the way that your actual hand is when you write it down on paper one of the things I loved about your book, which you reminded me of, is how um, it challenges my sort of modern assumption that we are we have a monopoly on sort of being sophisticated and complicated. <laughs> no, they, they invented it back then. <laughs> yeah. Well, they had um, no Internet, so they had lots of time in the evenings. That's also true. Um, and then uh, talking about being sophisticated and complicated. Now, I, I um, every time I try and think or talk about ciphers and codes 
my mind goes entirely blank. Your chapter was the nearest I've got to being able to follow <laughs> something <laughs> on ciphers and codes, but I can't. I even then I couldn't do it. Uh, it's, but that's me. I, I, there's a blank spot where that bit of my brain should be. And that was one of the things that actually was quite fascinating because these, a lot of the ciphers and codes being used in the early modern period seemed to me to be incredibly complicated. <laughs> And yes. the idea that you could crack these things just with the sheer power of mind, um, obviously I'm speaking to someone with a mind that resolutely does not work like this, seemed to me to be an extraordinary thing. So can you just talk me a little bit, you know, beginner's guides to early modern ciphers? Yeah, it, it will always remain a bit complicated, but we try to break it down. And, and in this period, um, cipher keys usually consisted of two parts. You had your cipher which was uh, quite often almost always a substitution alphabet. So the letter A could be one, the letter B, two, three um, was uh, the C. So it could be... So so let's just take over this bit. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I'm just I'm thinking... <laughs> No, I mean, not because that's wrong. We're just it's because it's 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 it is a very confusing subject. I thought I was doing well. Yeah, you there. were doing well, but you you were missing out three things, at least. Um, firstly, I think it's you're absolutely right. It is complicated, but they found it really difficult too. I mean, we we have several people saying that they find this really difficult. Um, Babington, when he's working on during the Babington plot, has to have a poet help him decipher the letters he's getting because he can't do it properly. So they're having trouble doing it too. And it also takes them an awful long time. They spend a lot of time doing this. Philippe has complains about one code, says this took me 20 days to do this, to, to work out this letter. So what Nadine was talking about, absolutely right, that there, there's a difference between ciphers and codes, firstly, and that a cipher key would have two parts of it. One would be the cipher, which is a substitution alphabet, where the letters of the alphabet are replaced by a letter or a number or a, a symbol, a squiggle. Um, and then you'd have a code which you have words and names are all represented by a letter or a number or a squiggle. And so you end up with a kind of big menu of, of possibilities that you you work from from to actually encode and decode your letters. And it's it can be quite complicated and you can have um, several cipher alphabets and you can have nomenclature which is the code of, of say of a number say 44 being the king and blah blah, blah blah and you can have 30 of them or you can have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds that we've got we saw one with with like seven or eight hundred um parts of the nomenclature which of course is incredibly complicated and takes even longer because you're looking for everything trying to think and just a minute, i'm sure there's a there's a number for this somewhere and it's in the middle of this page with all these tiny little numbers in so, yes, it is complicated and, and it does take an awfully long time. And they knew that and they spent an awful long time. These days, of course, you look at it and you think, if I can't crack it within five minutes, then I'm giving up. But it just it takes ages to crack these things. It takes a long time. It takes a long time even when you've got the, the, the cipher key, which is why we, we included the, um, the, the nicely written out bit of the Babington, one of the letters. Just say, decode this and you'll see how long it takes. Could you just give us a brief, brief pricey, um of the Babington affair and how ciphers and codes fitted into it, just to give an example of how these things that we're talking about had real life application during the period? Yes, the, the Babington plot is one of the many plots that were designed to overthrow and eventually assassinate Elizabeth I and replace her by her distant with her distant cousin, uh, Mary Queen of Scots. It's perhaps the best... Uh, the, the most well-known plot, uh, because it, it led to Mary Queen of Scots' execution, um, and therefore it's, it's obviously also the, the final plot. Um, we look at it because they were using so many cipher codes during the unraveling of, of, of that specific plot. Um, so we thought if we focus on a well-known history, we can just uh, concentrate on, on the ciphers and codes, which is complicated enough, as you say. Uh, but we found that by looking at techniques, the, the stories became much more nuanced. And actually, in the, the Babington plot, the key players change. Uh, we thought it was a, a battle between Elizabeth I and, and uh, with Walsingham and then Mary Queen of Scots, whereas in fact, if you start looking at it, it's a battle between secretaries or cryptanalysts. On the one hand, you have Thomas Philippus uh, on the side of Elizabeth I, and then uh, Mary Queen of Scots has three secretaries of her own, even though she is 
uh, imprisoned. Uh, and these three secretaries hardly get any mention in biographies of Mary Queen of Scots, whereas they are the key players. Mm. So, and these guys are sort of sending the sending stuff in and out, and then they're trying to decode de de decode. Yes, <laughs> each other's um, each other's missives as well. So it's a kind of game of cat and mouse, but but done through crypt, you know, cryptology. Uh, cryptology. Um, yes, yeah, so this is the point. The battle lines here are people sitting at their desks. Yeah. That, that's where the battles are taking place. And what's happening, of course, is that the the Mary's secretaries think that they're they're getting their letters through unencumbered, but they're being intercepted. And they're being intercepted by somebody who A is, is an expert code breaker and B actually knows what the codes are anyway. So mm. because that he's not just intercepting the letters, he's intercepting the codes because one the of the cipher keys. Yeah, the cipher keys. Thank you. One of the things the things about ciphers and, and codes is that they're you you need to know them at both ends mm. and what what they were doing when they started off a communication with somebody they used a relatively simple cipher key mary queen of scots mary, thank you yeah. mary queen of scots secretaries would use a relatively simple cipher key and if they thought that the conversation was worth having they would then switch to a much more complicated cipher key and this happens with Babington. they say we've responded to your letter but we're going to send you a, a new key because you need you need a better key for this because it's going to be harder for anyone to to unravel if they intercept it, ignoring the, the possibility that they might just intercept the cipher key. Right. This is the nursery key and the um, yes. mature, mature one. <laughs> How do you become somebody who becomes an early modern code breaker? So in this case, you had Thomas Philippus, who, who was trained on that uh, diplomatic embassy. So diplomats used a lot of cipher keys. So he really got kind of training on on the diplomatic job. Uh, mm. But he was also a, um, a very skilled linguist. So he, he knew a, a lot of languages. And that is incredibly handy because you're working, if you're trying to break a code with frequency analysis, um, every language, the different letters are more f- are frequent than others. So if, if you... Uh, you would use a different kind of schemata when you're working with the English language than you would be working with Italian or Spanish. So in order for you to recognize it, you need to be able to recognize the words as well in the end. Um, Mm. So it's mathematics, but also a lot of linguistic skills. And uh, Thomas Philippus was certainly really um, uh, well trained. Yes, and it's also the kind of skills that you you have if you you like to solve puzzles it's cr- uh, crossword breaking skills that kind of mind um is, is the one that that people would recognize that you know this guy is going to be really good at this we'll train him um it's mm. just like academia you see people people have a certain way of looking at something and you think actually they'll be good for this and they'll be good for that and these guys were picked up or ended up gravitating towards code breaking because they were ling- very good ling- linguists and they had this uh, this very good pattern recognition skills and that that kind of thing you end up just in the same way that you you would spot somebody who's obviously going to be good in a fight um because he's you know big and he's very good mm. at a sword if you've got somebody who's kind of Sit, very good at sitting at the desk and working out things and but, speaks a lot of languages you think not going to be a fighter but might be rather good in the office <laughs> i think um sadly i can neither do the fighting nor the coding so i'd be absolutely useless in this code so as you pointed out that because there was a kind of innate flaw that these things could be cracked then they were also using um disguise and distraction to try and get communications through um so just talk to me a little bit about what you mean by that yeah, so if you think about cryptology, cryptology has two branches, uh, cryptography, that's the cipher and codes, but also steganography, which is hiding things, uh, words in plain sight. So the problem with any cipher key, if you start using it, is that the numbers or the little squiggles and symbols will, will stare back at you. Uh, once So an intercept, interceptor of a letter will immediately know this person has something to hide because I only see strings of numbers or strings of symbols. So... Um, Another way of hiding things is using mercantile discourse, which is a steganographic technique that's hiding things in plain sight. And you could, for instance, say, I will order 12 gloves from Paris, where in fact you meant the army is going to invade Newcastle on Monday. Uh, so that that letter looks completely innocent. Um, and of course, the, the thing what, what happened to us after working for years and years on spies and knowing this 
the, the most plain letters suddenly look coded. Where of course, sometimes uh, a pair of gloves is just, just a, a pair, pair of gloves. gloves. <laughs> <laughs> it's very yeah. true. It's so easy to spot someone. I know it's going on. I know what they mean here. And because they, I mean, as as Azine said, they this mercantile discourse. People really had fun with this. So there, there's one um, bunch of people we looked at who had who called Elizabeth I the Merchant of Newcastle and called Walsingham the Merchant's wife. <laughs> because they 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 like playing around so it was very it was a deadly serious business but they weren't po-faced until they were executed of course yeah um and there were other ways of trying to hide stuff i mean there, in the civil war period it seemed to me that there was quite a lot of people um swallowing secret messages in inventive ways and then waiting for nature to take its course Yes, that, 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 that sounds awful um, if you start thinking about it. But they were covering letters in in wax or put them in little copper boxes. Uh, and especially women and children were used as messengers there because they were sort of unsuspected anyway. But if they were caught, uh, then they were given um, a, a kind of enema or, or, or well, other... Laxative or purgative, yeah. Yeah, to, to get the messages out. Oh, so both so both sides knew that this was going on. So even if you were an innocent woman, you know, making your way between the royalists and the and, and the the parliamentarians, you could find yourself being forcibly given an enema. Well, yes, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's just like when the married girls go on in the airports. Apparently, <laughs> same yeah. thing. Um, and the uh, the other way of hiding was obviously um, secret ink, which I loved your bit on secret ink. Obviously, what I you know I remember spending hours as a child, again pre internet days, you know, making my own secret ink out of lemons and things. Um, and that that's a thing. Lemons lemons based secret ink is a thing. But you have a fantastic chapter where you discuss um, secret ink and all its you know all its proliferations. Yes, we we. Indeed, loved in Fitz Wings as well, and, and also the realization um, there is more than lemon juice. And um, in, in archives and libraries, it always says lemon juice letters, where in fact they had so many ways of, of mixing there in Fitz Wings. Uh, a, a much more clever way of doing things was using alum and mixing that with a little bit of water, and that gives a very transparent liquid. And uh, the, the great benefit of alum is that it's the only invisible ink which, after uh, a water refill, will um, make itself invisible like, again. So when it dries, it becomes invisible. So that's the only one which sort of um, goes back to invisibility um, and, and works uh, several times. It will eventually fade, but you can do it several times. And the great thing about alum is you can also use it on fabric. And if you submerge that um, in water, it will reveal instantly. And um, it works with a heat reveal if you use it on paper, but just as lemon juice, just as vinegar or milk uh, or urine even. Uh, but with a heat reveal, it takes a little while. And it, it's, it's when it's scorched into visibility, it's, it's there permanently. Um, so it has its own complications. And you also love to set fire to the letter, which, of course, is embarrassing. I was reading your letter of 15th March. Unfortunately, I set fire to it halfway through. Could you send it again, please? Yeah, burn, there's so many letters. after reading, not before. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there's so many letters with scorch marks where you, see, you can sort of see, oh, this has gone nearly wrong. I mean, one, of the, oh, the so great you... things, one of the great things about this, sorry, is that when you start to look at the materiality, you start to see things in, in comments. And so when we were looking through some of the interrogation reports about the... Um, the end of the aftermath of the gunpowder plot we we noticed that there were little things saying make sure that he, he's you know check that he hasn't got scarves check that he hasn't got any any handkerchiefs or anything that he doesn't pass them to somebody and you look at that and you think why would anyone care if he's got a handkerchief but as soon as you realize that alan works on linen and of course it does it's obvious that it does because linen is made out of uh, paper was made out of linen waste anyway so it's obvious that it does but you never think of that and then suddenly that that comment about handkerchiefs and scarves becomes check that he hasn't got any more messages on him that he's trying to hand to other people god that's so amazing so you so so by looking at the kind of you know the physical the physical properties of the things that you're talking about it gives you new insights into the kind of broader yeah documentation that's so cool and you were saying that um nadine that you can see the scorch marks so can you actually in the archives there are documents 
that you can hold well you probably can't hold them you can sort of point at them in the archives but that have sort of scor- scorch marks on them from revealing the ink yes absolutely and and sometimes you can hold the letter just sometimes they are loose in, in in boxes so they're not always bound into volume so uh sometimes you can really hold them up uh and and you see the scorch marks you see where that's gone wrong uh also with the the properties of normal ink that kind of call water and copperas if, if you do not immediately mix it in a container, you can use both parts, both individual components as your invisible ink, and then reveal it with the other component. So you can have cold water as your invisible ink, reveal it with copper as, or use copper as your invisible ink, and then refill it with gold water. But if you make a mistake as a recipient, the, the sender has used copper as, and the recipient thinks, I'm going to reveal it with copper as, you end up with an inky smear on the page. So you also see that in archives where, where people have just accidentally blackened half the letter because they were using the wrong reagent. And the publishers, when we send these photographs, they're like, why, why do you want this image? It's just an inky splodge. We're like, yes, it's an inky splodge. Isn't it wonderful? <laughs> and they're like, huh? What are you it, about? Must be, it must be amazing coming across these things in the archive and knowing what it is that you're looking at and understanding the material kind of consequences of these things the only problem is you do do get thrown out when you start start trying to reveal letters with (laughs) with your lighter they don't like that much but we certainly thought okay what what has sort of escaped the interceptor's attention because how many more invisible ink messages are there which we'll never know about because as pete said you can't really start making uh, letters wet again or, no. or, or uh, pouring some other liquid over it. And we certainly saw plenty of letters where people have, tr- have tried to reveal invisible ink that wasn't there. They're like, we're going to check this. And it's like, OK, there's nothing there. Oh, and we've, we've got letters saying, yes, I, I told you there was nothing there. Now you've wrecked the letter. <laughs> uh, so have you guys made your own different invisible links then have you used alum yourselves and please tell me you don't communicate by email right you communicate by alum tell me (laughs) well we sometimes do with our friends it's the greatest (laughs) feeling to send a a, a locked letter uh, into the post and it just it just arrives as long as you put a stamp on it it will make it through uh, the postal system. So we would definitely encourage other people to do that as well. Uh, it's so much fun to start there, writing there, letters there again. Are, there is an invisible ink setting on, on Messenger, isn't there? On 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 the iPhone. I'm sure oh, there's one there? that you can send it as invisible ink and as soon as you open it, it suddenly reveals itself. Oh, that's is... that's slightly re- less romantic than scratching yes, on that's true. linen, perhaps. Um, yeah. Uh, one, uh, the last chapter of your book, I hope you haven't done too many experiments on, and that's the the bit on um, assassinations and um, kind of covert action, I guess, early modern style. So sometimes the you know there's there's murder and mayhem as well amongst the spies of early modern uh, England. Just tell me a little bit about that. We we purposely made it the final chapter saying you have all these techniques and if everything fails, there's always assassination. Uh, so it, it's uh, deliberately in the final chapter. Kill before eating. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we go through various techniques and um, poison is the technique uh, you want as an assassin because you don't have to be in the room. Um, so you don't have to be any near your target. Yes, I think, again, we, we were thinking of the materiality and the materiality of, of stabbing someone is quite obvious until you think, well, actually, if I'm assassinating somebody with a knife, um, there's going to be somebody next to them and they're probably going to stab me back. So actually, maybe that's not so good. And even with that, with a handgun, we talk about the, the, the way that they, the gun started getting small enough to conceal. But even with a handgun, you still had to be relatively close and you weren't that likely to get away with it as some of the people who did assassinate or try to assassinate various heads of state found to their cost. Poisoning, of course, is potentially something you can do much more stealthily. So you can poison something and then run away. And the poison actually works when somebody does something or eats something. Or you can even get poison delivered by a maid or someone totally innocuous who'd never be suspected or by a third party. And so, it, and it's it's invisible most of the time, and people don't know it's there. So, of course, they're terrified of it because they don't know it's there, but they know it exists. So, it's it's a real fear in gender as well as a, an effective method sometimes. And how good were um, early modern, uh, I guess, 
whoever did the autopsies, if they, how good were they at um, working out whether it was poison or natural causes? Like, could you get away with it completely, or was, or was it, you know, a detectable crime? Um, there, there were ways that they thought they could tell, and obviously, in certain situations, it, it's quite obvious. Um, but only in certain situations is obvious there had been poison happening. But of course, autopsies had had other problems as well, and their autopsies were were kind of ceremonial to a degree, and they they would talk about. Uh, certain effects that had happened which were nothing to do with poisons and it's like oh their, their liver's a bit swollen therefore it's like therefore you, you should look to their diet of course their liver's a bit swollen and so you looking back at them it's it, they're not so useful as, as perhaps people might think so the, the real problem is that often they didn't even know that poison had been used unless they actually used it themselves so unless you had actually given poison to somebody what they did do is they had a lot of ways of of preventing poison from working whether they worked or not in fact most of them didn't work but they had a lot of methods like unicorn horn mithridatum um ferre act which is also called treacle which i always think is quite amusing the fact that the treacle is is come from a a panacea an anti-poison panacea so they had these things which were meant to prevent or cure poison after the fact but they, they generally didn't, sadly. I mean, even in the Overbury case, it's it's still not plain, and it wasn't plain at the time, whether he was poisoned or just was so unhealthy and was poisoning himself by the amount of other things he was taking. Sorry, that, the Overbury case, you need to expand on that for us. Oh, the Overbury, it's, it's, it's a... It's, basically, Thomas Overbury was um, a, a friend of, I'm trying to think of the... Uh, I'm trying to remember all the people involved. It's so it's so complicated. My brain seizes up sometimes. Perhaps not not go into this for it's so yeah, complicated. It is it's quite complicated. But basically, it's, it's somebody who ended up being poisoned. That people ended up being done for poisoning. It's a very very yeah. famous poisoning case in the in the sixteen teens, sixteen teens, and sixteen teens, where he he didn't approve of the behaviour of one of his friends and his friend got got really pissed off with him it was actually the friend's new wife and they poisoned him allegedly and he was in prison and he was refusing to die he was very ill but he seemed they were doing all sorts of things putting all sorts of stuff on his on his food and in the sauces but he he wasn't using the sauces and he, he was still very ill and eventually allegedly they sent an apothecary's boy in to give him um, a mercury um, supplement enema which is allegedly what finally killed him but even then, it's not entirely clear that he died from being specifically poisoned, mm. as opposed to just being generally poisoned by all the stuff that he was taking anyway. Yeah, and as you say, I mean, the, you know, how do you how do you work out what's poison and what's just the terrible lifestyles and diets? Yes, well, I mean, also because a lot of the things that people did as a, as a general matter of course were very toxic. But, um, Arthur Gregory poisoned himself to, to a degree with experimenting with certain certain things to make um, count, help make counterfeit seals. Um, people used to take a lot of um, different preparations they thought which they thought were healthy, but actually you look at them and you think, sorry, you're taking this for your health. <laughs> this is not a very bacon, for example, used to take a maceration of rhubarb every every month, and it was partic- particularly to purge himself. So he knew that it would make it make him vomit. But that was the point, and because rhubarb is poisonous, you eat too much, of it, it'll make you ill. But the thing is, they would, they would in that case they used it, and the the poison for a, a particular purpose. But mm. people messed with heavy metals more than they ought, and they used to experiment. If you were doing any sort of alchemical stuff, you're regularly using mercury, not very good for you. And so, it's, lifestyles were kind of not very conducive in those days. Mm. You say, um, just just you know, rounding things off. You say that this period that you're covering, um, you talk about it being kind of the final years of the 16th century and the first few decades of the 17th century as being prime years for the theory and practice of English espionage. What, why do you think those years particularly uh, gave rise to so much inventiveness, so much kind of trade craft, so much um, exciting history? I think in the beginning of the period, when you have Elizabeth I coming to the throne, she's replacing a a Catholic, uh, Mary, and uh, she's surrounded by by Spain and France, and and there's another claimant uh, to the throne, Mary Queen of Scots, so she feels threatened, and they are trying to protect her by gaining secret information and intercepting letters. 
um, during the civil wars, because it was relatively quiet during uh, James's reign, apart from the blip of the gunpowder plot, uh, there was no uh, real need for spying uh, in England at the time. Uh, but you see, it, it be, it's becoming an issue again during the civil wars, and a lot of things change because the entire uh, countries, uh, the three kingdoms, are in, in disarray. Um, and you see a lot of women also getting involved at the time um, because when everything is stable, uh, they didn't really want to use women because w women were seen as uh, not really credible. Uh, but, but when during the Civil War, when the men were on the battlefield or actually had fled to the continent, a lot of women just took over and became involved. Um, you see everything stabilising during um, the interregnum, when you have Cromwell sort of realising, instead of relying on a lone wolf, I'm just going to put a couple of men into one room and they're going to share their tradecraft with each other. They're going to share their information. So Cromwell built a kind of the first uh, English intelligence unit. So you see uh, Black Chambers also uh, popping up in, in, in England. Black Chambers, you'll have to define them briefly for us. Yes. Uh, so you have 10 men sitting around a, a table in a room. One opens the letter, the other copies it, the other translates it. There's a, someone specialising in ciphers and in, in, in codes. There's an expert in invisible ink. And within hours, they have opened all the mail and uh, refolded it again, hoping that the recipient is none the wiser. Um, mm. So... Cromwell started the general post office, not so much to deliver mail, but to intercept mail. So <laughs> that is, a, I think, a great realisation of this period. That's how the general post office started, to properly spy uh, on, on mail in, in a kind of most efficient manner. And it's, specific, it's, it's explicitly done for that reason. He says, this is why we're doing the general post office. It will allow us to read everyone's mail and stop plots from happening. That's extraordinary. I'd already, I've always had a quite a soft spot for Cromwell, but I'm going to have to rethink that. <laughs> <laughs> um, on that note, I think um, that was absolutely brilliant. Your book is so full of amazing little details and um, extraordinary facts and incredible stories. So I absolutely urge anybody listening to go out and buy it because we have barely scratched the surface. We have uh, you know, applied heat to one word of it uh, in order to reveal it. it but th there's so much more to to, re uh, to read there. So go out and buy it, everybody. And Nadine and Pete, thank you so much for joining me on Spy Masters. Thank you for having us. Thank you so pleasure. much. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to follow, tweet, spread the word so that we can keep bringing you more brilliant writers talking about spies. Don't miss an episode of the Spy Masters podcast.